I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. We have back with us on The Truth of the Matter, Dr. Elliot Cohen, my colleague at CSIS, who's our Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy. He's also, of course, a legendary Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies professor and dean. And you can read him all the time in the Atlantic magazine where he's a columnist. Elliot, welcome back to the podcast. Andrew, always great to be back with you. So Elliot, you've just returned from Kiev where you actually met with President Zelensky and you got the lay of the land right there. What was the trip all about and what did you learn? So this was a trip that was organized by the Polish foreign policy think tank. It goes by the initials PISM, P-I-S-M. And it's a government-funded, I would say quasi-official think tank. It was a small group of people, a number of us from the Washington area think tanks. Mick Ryan, who's an Australian general, uh, who's had some very, very shrewd commentary on the war. Francois Heisbourg, who was the senior, really sort of the guru of French strategic studies, and a British Russia expert. So it was a small group of eight or nine people. First, the Polish military hosted us to the logistical hubs that are supporting Ukraine. And then we took a train into Kiev. We met with Zelensky. We got a briefing from a very senior member of the general staff, we had dinner with the vice foreign minister of Ukraine, Spent a better part of a day in Irpin, which is a suburb, I don't know, maybe 15 miles or so north of Kiev, where there was very heavy fighting and also, of course, uh, massacres in the initial invasion. The highlight, obviously, meeting President Zelensky. And so, you know, it was a trip which I would say strengthened a number of conclusions I had. I don't think I came away with anything dramatically new, but it was quite impressive to meet Zelensky in particular. He is every bit as impressive in person as one would have expected by seeing him on the news. What was the security around him like? And what was the security around you all like? We had incredible security. We had about a a dozen huge Polish security people with us. And they took lots of precautions. Now, the truth is, when you go to Kiev, Kiev feels quite normal. There's a lot of traffic in the streets, a lot of cars, quite a few pedestrians on the streets. I suspect maybe a bit fewer than there would have been. But restaurants and cafeterias and so on are, are all operating. Interestingly enough, no billboards with heroic images, or very few, there are few. And, you you know, here and there you can see where there are anti-tank defenses that have been prepared and that they could probably move in quickly. But the idea is, I think the idea in Kiev itself is normalcy. Zelensky's security is incredibly tight. And uh, the presidential palace is, obviously I won't share any details, but it's, it's extremely well fortified. And you can tell that they're taking his personal security extremely seriously, as, of course, they have to. I mean, the Russians have have indeed tried to kill him. That's, I think, just the way he has to live. For me, the most impressive thing about Zelensky was, and it's a tone that he sets, but I I think it very much is reflected in his subordinates. I would say a mood of, certainly of determination, of optimism, uh, but not cockiness. These were, you know, there's confidence they're going to win this thing. They're determined to win it. There's a great awareness of the costs. There's a, a profound sense of urgency, particularly get, about getting even more assistance, which I think we would be well advised to provide. But it, in that way, reassuring. I'd also say, you know, I've, I've seen quite a few heads of state, unfortunately, in the middle of war. And the thing that distinguished the landscape, I thought, was he, he was certainly on top of the details, but he was uh, clearly in good physical condition. Looked to me like he'd been getting enough sleep and uh, had a sense of humor and could listen. And all those things are you can't take for granted, uh, given the, the kind of stress that, that war entails. He really understands optics, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely. I think he's, uh, you know, people made fun of him as an actor. But the truth is that served him well. That, you know, from the very beginning of the, the war, first he begins wearing this sort of quasi-military garb, an olive drab uh, t-shirt and so forth. And that in itself sends a certain signal. I'm a civilian, but this is wartime. We're take, treating it as wartime. If you remember going back to the, almost the very first night where he goes out in the street and he's got all of his senior advisors around him and he, of course, takes the, uses the modern art form, the selfie, to say, you know, we're here, we're all here, we're 
president's here, the chief of staff is here, the minister of defense is here, and so forth. He understood the importance of, of the image. And uh, that's a critical part of wartime leadership. Churchill understood it. FDR understood it. And it's been invaluable to them. I, I mean, I think you're, this is a case where you're really looking at an individual who made a tremendous difference. Yeah, I'll say. When you were there, Elliot, the polls also showed you sort of how they're getting material and equipment into Ukraine. What was your takeaway from that? So the first thing I would say is you know, the Polish military is very impressive. They're they're quite Americanized in some ways. The general officers all speak excellent English. Uh, they've served with us in Poland and Iraq. And it just feels like a professional, very professional military. It's sort of a little tell on that was we were getting a briefing from a lieutenant colonel and we had with us a very, very senior Polish general. And because it's a small group, it was an informal conversation. The general said something about, I forget what it was, how much stuff is being shipped. Or, and the lieutenant colonel says, excuse me, sir, that's not really right. The real numbers are X, Y, and Z. And the general just kind of chuckled and said, well, you know, that teaches me. And, you know, the, the lieutenant colonel was perfectly respectful. But, you know, that only happens in a highly professional military where the lieutenant colonel feels self-confident enough to correct a very senior general officer in front of foreigners, and the general officer thinks that's just fine. That's what he's supposed to do. You know, that's a, that's a mark of a real professional military. It is not, I assure you, what would happen in the Russian military. The only thing that was concerning was the, the base was extremely well organized and operated. You could tell it is underutilized. And between the, the demand signal from the Ukrainians for what they need and our ability to provide what they need, it's clear there's a lot more room to give them lots of stuff. They're getting some of the right quality, but they also need a lot of quantity. At what capacity are the Poles getting things in? Is it is it 50%, 60%? The system itself, they said, is used to maybe like a something on the order of a 60% of capacity. So in other words, you could almost double what you were giving without having to break a sweat. And, you know, that would make a difference because even though you know, the Ukrainians are getting precision weapons and so forth, still they need a lot and they need a lot of everything. And I think one of the takeaways is something I've believed all along, but, but certainly a takeaway is you know, we need to give the Ukrainians the absolute maximum so that they can win this thing quickly and decisively and in a way that will spare as, as much of their population and, frankly, the hapless Russian soldiers who are being thrown into the meat grinder as much as possible. You said something the other day that really resonated with me. You said that this war has awakened the muscle memory of the Cold War for NATO and the United States. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Well, there, as, as in any decision to go to war, there are a lot of misjudgments that get made all around. And one of the misjudgments that Vladimir Putin made, but let's be honest, we made as well, is underestimating European and American resolve and commitment. Uh, I would not have, you know, I, I would expect would have expected the United States to provide aid, not at the level, not the quality or the quantity even that we have. I would not have expected the Europeans to be willing to say, look, we'll wear two sweaters this winter if that's what we have to do. I wouldn't have expected the Germans to say, we're going to double the defense budget and we're going to provide lethal aid to Ukraine. And I could go on and on. And the question is, okay, why did we make those misjudgments? And I think one of the misjudgments, or one of the things perhaps simply that we overlooked, was that th this war of you know, egregious aggression was almost calculated, I mean, it wasn't calculated, but it could have been, to awake the muscle memory of the Cold War, of Russia as a dangerous, aggressive, cruel power out to impose its will. And once the shock was big enough, which it wasn't in Crimea or earlier in Donbass, but was with this massive invasion, then a lot of the old impulses come back, you know, in the same way that if you hadn't ridden a bicycle for 20 years, you know, you get on it, you're going to wobble a little bit, but it's going to come back to you. So let's talk about Putin for a second, or more than a second, really. He's announced that he's ordered 300,000 more reservists 
to support the Russian war in Ukraine. He's drafting people left and right. He's drafting 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds. He's pulling people out of their homes, out of their jobs. What's happening there in Russia? And, you know, how important is it for Putin to maintain the support of the Russian people? The Russian military is actually relatively small. So the Russian army, let's set aside the Air Force, Navy, and, and so forth. You know, something over 300,000 troops plus the paratroops and special units and so forth. So maybe something under 400,000 troops. And well over 50% of those ended up being committed in Ukraine, possibly as high as 80, 85%, depending on how you count things. And they've gotten chewed up. I mean, the Russians have probably lost something like 80,000 dead and wounded, maybe less, but conceivably more. And simply if they're going to hold ground, they need more bodies. I mean, that's an astonishing number. It is an astonishing number. And um, it tells you something about the nature of high-intensity modern combat, which is sobering and that we need to think about. So they they would need to do something. Now, the problem is they don't have a reserve system as we would understand it. You know, we're... You know, if you're in the National Guard, you do all your military training and then you're doing a weekend a month and two weeks in the summer or, you know, something like the Israeli or Finnish systems where you're activated for a month a year or something like that. And you're being continually trained and you still need to be trained up before you can then deploy. But, you know, the depots are all there. The organization is all there. This is infinitely more chaotic. They don't have the material it appears to give them. They don't have the... Uh, they're they're just kind of pulling people out as individuals, so they're going to have to recreate new units. Remember, the Russian military doesn't have uh, sergeants, as we understand them, who are the backbone of not all, but most Western militaries. So the result is they don't have the logistics worked out. It's it's a giant chaotic mess in which a lot of men are going to be thrown into a situation for which they're completely unprepared and get slaughtered. They'll just get slaughtered. And And I think... You know, at one level, Putin doesn't have a choice unless he's willing to give up on this adventure. On the other hand, you know, the basic deal that Putin has cut over with the Russian people over the last couple of decades is you stay out of politics and you can have a better life than you had before. And, you know, this is not a population that's been mobilized for war. It's a population that may approve it or be neutral, but in any case, this is something that happens on television sets. It's not something where you have to send your son or brother or husband off to fight. And that's one of the ways, I think, in which this uh, mobilization is going to trigger quite substantial social unrest. You're, you see the beginnings of that. The repressive forces of the state can probably cope with that for now, but you can't guarantee that they can cope with that indefinitely. Yeah, I was going to say, does it matter? You know, that they're out protesting at this point? Does it matter that the protests could continue? Or is it irrelevant to Putin and his inner circle? I think he probably thinks, he probably feels it's irrelevant for now. You can repress people, you can terrorize people. But any country at war, even a totalitarian country, needs willing participation. You know, even Stalin's Soviet Union, even Hitler's Germany. They relied a lot on coercion, but they also relied a lot on positive motivation. And there just isn't any of this. So, you know, the most you can hope for is a kind of, they can hope for, is a kind of sullen, passive acceptance, which isn't really enough to carry you through. Well, you know, I keep thinking, personally, I'm closer I'm in my 50s and I'm closer to being a grandparent than I am to being a soldier and they're pulling people my age and older out of their out of their regular life and saying okay here go fight. I mean I can only imagine you know the the back problems, the knee problems, the the vision, the all, all the things that you know you think of as you're aging where you're really not in the kind of shape no matter how good of shape you're in. You're not, you know, I swim five times a week. I'm not in good enough shape to go fight a war. Oh, and I'm a couple of years ahead of you, and I, I feel that even, even more so. Interesting, even the, you know, the, the cheerleaders on the Russian uh, news, uh, 
have been reporting stories of, you know, people called up who are half blind or have diabetes. And you see these videos, you know, even with commanders addressing the troops saying, you know, you, you think you've got a bad, I'm on pills, I've got a bad knees. It, it's um, a disaster. And the, the thing is, what you'll get out of this will be, uh, first, I think you'll get a lot of passive resistance and sabotage. I mean, that's sort of how Russians have dealt with this, you'll have disastrous losses on the front line because they won't know how to take care of themselves. But also, you have to remember, these people will be fed into, a lot of them will be fed into units which have a relatively small cadre of people who are really suffering from post-traumatic stress, who may very well say, okay, it's your turn to die. And so, you know, that's that's going to be hard. They don't have a an officer corps and certainly not a non-commissioned officer corps to, to hold it all uh, together. And the final thing is that the challenge that is, will be harder for the regime, and you're beginning to see this, is actually less the draftees themselves than the mothers and wives. And because, you know, traditionally in Russia, that's when things get difficult. Like on Afghanistan, it got, began to get difficult when you had the mothers of soldiers protesting. You know, they're willing to brutalize women, but if it's a large number of mothers showing up, that's a lot harder to get, you know, the riot police to crack heads. Well, and I can't imagine, I mean, you know, winter is coming and I can't imagine the Russian military is going to have, you know, high tech Patagonia jackets. It's going to be cold. Look, I think as much as Ukraine struggles with its own logistics, if you want to place a bet on who's more likely to have an L bean quality parka uh, this winter, I, a Ukrainian soldier or a Russian soldier, I would say the Ukrainian soldier. Well, this is something L.L. Bean and Patagonia and, and the rest can actually send over and supply to them. I'm not joking. I'm yeah. sure that before very long, you'll begin to see appeals for that kind of thing. Of course, a lot of it's sourced to China, which is another issue. But I suspect that the, the Chinese companies that uh, manufacture this, those things will be perfectly willing to ship them to the U.S. and thence to uh, Ukraine. Well, let me ask you about China and Russia for a minute. So, you know, Russia's not exactly feeling the love right now from Xi Jinping in Beijing. No. On February 4th, there was a meeting in Beijing between Xi and Xi Jinping and uh, Putin, in which uh, they declared uh, you know, an unlimited friendship, uh, not an alliance. So even there, then they, they qualified it. But it's clear the friendship has limits. I mean, the Chinese have, to our knowledge, have not supplied arms, certainly not large quantities of arms, to the Russians. Chinese companies have been scared off by secondary sanctions. The Chinese have repeatedly declared, most recently in New York, just like I think two weeks ago, uh, in a meeting between the Chinese and Ukrainian foreign ministers, their commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The Chinese have very pointedly asserted their concern about Kazakhstan's territorial integrity and sovereignty. You know, the, the obvious thinking there is that if the Russians got away with this in Ukraine, they might want to try something similar in Kazakhstan, which has a, a large Russian-speaking minority. So the, it's clear the friendship has limits. And, you know, at the end of the day, the, uh, the Chinese won't break with Russia, I don't think. But nobody really likes to be allied to the gang that couldn't shoot straight. And to the extent that the Russians look incompetent or feckless, I think it really diminishes the relationship. And so I, I think this may actually be conducive to more friction in the Sino-Russian relationship than we saw before. You know, one of the big things that's hanging over this discussion and all discussions about the war in Ukraine is the potential that Russia would use uh, a nuclear weapon. Everybody's worried about that. What's your take on that issue or set of issues it presents? One absolutely has to take it seriously, both because the Russians do think differently about nuclear weapons than we do. At least in their doctrine, they are more willing to contemplate the use of nuclear weapons, starting with demonstration shots. But also, anytime somebody talks about that, you take them seriously in the same way, you know, if somebody says, I'd like to take this knife and cut off your head, you would take that seriously, even if you think the probabilities are relatively low. That said, it's very hard to see how the use of a tactical nuclear weapon would make uh, sense for the Russians. There's no good target unless they begin blowing up cities where you're a different place. They have to know the international repercussions would be severe. I believe 
Jake Sullivan when he says that the White House has been pretty explicit in telling them really bad things are going to happen if you do that, and here are some of them. You know, so I think we've probably spelled it out. Have they been specific publicly about what they've said? No, they've been very clear that they have said things, but they're not saying what they said. But the way Sullivan expressed it was that we have spelled out to the Russians what the consequences are going to be. And I think they would be really every last sanction in the book that you could throw at them. Maybe for all I know, American conventional intervention in the war, certainly I'm sure, you know, giving the Ukrainians anything other than uh, nuclear weapons. I think the other thing is, you know, there are breaks on the system. It's not as if Vladimir Putin can just press a button and off goes a nuclear weapon. I don't think it works that way. So we've been clear from the administration that this is just a red line that can't be crossed. And that gives you confidence. Yeah. I mean, although, you know, Putin has surprised all of us, myself included, before. And we have to assume that he's under a lot of pressure. You know, you're dealing with a guy who's 70, who's probably feeling his own mortality, whose great historical enterprise is cratering, who is isolated and is probably not getting a lot of dissenting opinions, has spent the last couple of years really in, in isolation. And his calculus might look very different than ours. Well, what happens to him? You know, if they lose, if this becomes just a frozen conflict, a stalemate, what happens to Putin? And, you know, and, and including you know, the fact that he's, you know, drafting, you know, people who aren't fit to fight. I think it's very unlikely that he will be in power, let's say, two years. From. I think it is conceivable he could end up dead tomorrow. It's conceivable that he gets a kind of Khrushchevian, you know, retirement where you get to live in your dacha, but don't going to travel more than 100 meters from it. I have to think, unfortunately, it's not, I don't know whether I would even say unfortunately. I think the most likely thing is that somebody kills him. This is getting closer and closer to being ruinous for the country and for a lot of individuals who will have to be absolutely furious at him and who see very little upside in keeping him around once he's pushed out of power. Well, Elliot, a lot to think about. Thank you very much. Even if it's a grim topic, always a pleasure to chat with you, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 